Hello and welcome to episode 66 of This Week in Germany. We'll be bringing the world to Germany and Germany to the world with news for the week beginning the 6th of April 2015. My name's Daniel. And I'm Rob. Each week we feature stories from the news, society and culture in the English language. If you want to find out more, including ways to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, SoundCloud and Spotify, head over to our website thisweekingermany.de. In this episode, the old-fashioned religious law which could have you paying a hefty fine for dancing at Easter. We'll be talking to journalist Ben Knight about how religion still affects German law. In Destination Germany, we travel to the Hall of Liberation that is a reminder of battles against the French Emperor Napoleon. Our German of the Week is Helmut Kohl, the former Chancellor who celebrated his 85th birthday this week. This man presided over the creation of the European Union and the reunification of Germany over his 16 years in office. Malachi Ray Rimpet will be joining us for April's Film Club. Our selection this month, Downfall. Laws created by Christian politicians of centuries past to strictly uphold Catholic and Protestant moral values. You would think that such rules have no place in a modern, democratic, and multicultural country such as Germany. Well, Rob, you'd be wrong. I'm sorry. Germany does not have an official state religion and is usually by convention secular. But laws which came from old religious customs and habits still exist today. Did you know that it's still illegal to dance during Easter? And if you played live music in a room selling drinks and food, you could be fined over a thousand euros. And if you live in one of Germany's bigger cities, the deference to religion could seem crazy. You don't know that many people that are still religious these days. Yeah, but living in big cities like Berlin or Hamburg, I mean, in Berlin, 60% of people are non-believers, and this could distort your view. The rest of the country, over 60%, are state-registered bona fide Christians. These days, the state helps to collect funds for churches through the tax system and enforces the closure of shops on the Lord's Day, Sunday. And many people want a greater separation of church and state in Germany. But that task is not as simple as... As you might think. Ben Knight wrote an article in the newspaper The Guardian this week on the Easter dancing ban, and he's joining us now. So, Ben, what is the Easter dancing ban? Okay, so have you seen the movie Footloose? Um, I haven't, but I know what it's about. Okay, it's a, it's a 1980s film with Kevin Bacon about a town in uh, America where dancing is banned, and not many people know that, in fact, on certain holy days, uh, holy Christian days in Germany, dancing is also banned. Uh, and that means that uh, it's the, they're called holiday. It's a holiday law, officially that's what it's called, but it's also colloquially called the Tanzverbot, the dancing ban. And it means that any public dancing event uh, is not allowed. Uh, and this is like... Any, so that means nightclubs, indoors or outdoors... They can't close, and even you can't even have um, live music in any room that, um, that that serves food and drink on these days. Now that is like there's, there's regional variations. It's a state by state affair, so different different states have different rules on everything. Um, but in general, that's what it is. And in the in Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria, which are like the most Catholic, uh, have the most uh, sort of most Christian cultures. The dancing ban is throughout Easter, so that is a Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Saturday uh, all uh, have, a, have a whole day ban. And then on Easter Sunday and Easter Monday, I'm talking about Baden-Württemberg especially now, the dancing ban uh, continues from 3 a.m. to 11 a.m. Now, obviously, uh, not many nightclubs are going to be open necessarily from 3 a.m. to 11 a.m., but there, there is this sort of uh, uh, this idea that you can't you can't have any public dancing event, so it's quite uh, and, and and Bavaria also has the dancing ban in place for various other Christian holidays, including All Saints Day, which uh, is first of November, and uh, also uh, a, a day called Volkstrauertag and uh, no Tortensonntag. That was it, Tortensonntag, which is the literally means the Sunday of the dead which is the first 
Sunday or the last Sunday before Advent. So it's in late, late November. And then on that day too, there is a dancing ban. Wow. Yeah. Interesting comparison with Footloose there. Yeah. Makes sense. So what happens if you organize a dance with live music and food and drink on Easter Sunday at 2 a.m., let's say? Well, you are, you are risking uh, a fine. Uh, the, the club, the event organizer would be risking a fine of up to, uh, in Baden-Württemberg, it's, uh, 1,500 euros. Uh, but as a caveat to that, I would say that the, it's policed by the, um, local Ordnungsamt, like the local district council Ordnungsamt. And that is not traditionally a very well staffed, uh, enterprise. I mean, we're talking about small little local councils with maybe a couple of officers and they would be policing these dancing bands so in practice a lot of the time you have know, different press reports but in practice a lot of the time um they're not heavily policed and a lot of um uh, nightclubs simply risk opening and hope that no one complains because if someone public if someone from the public does complain then the local council will will probably chase it up and then we'll shut that down and you'll get a fine but there are, uh but i talked this week to a few um, there's a local club collective in uh, Baden-Württemberg, which is which is sort of campaigning against this, and they they, they kind of represent the event management and uh, nightclub uh, sector in in that region. And there has been talk in that region of loosening this ban, relaxing it slightly. So they're kind of um, they're, they're, yeah, there's a, it's a controversy every year. It comes around every Easter. There's a, there are people talking about should we have it or not, and a lot of the church leaders come out and they start talking about why it's like so important to have these these quiet days, you know, as a contemplative days, and it's like this, and we should we should like try to nurture this sort of spirit, you know, this sort of uh, a, a moment a moment of spiritual calm amongst the, the, the hurly-burly of work and, and pleasure that we normally live through. So there's always these arguments, and you can read it, and it, it comes around every, every year, and you read it in all the different newspapers. And that. The idea of enforced calm seems very strange to me. But, uh, yeah, so I think some people would find it strange that laws which are based on uh, religious practices are enforced in uh, a Western country. Isn't Germany a secular society? Isn't church separated from state in Germany? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it, it is, like the, but it's not. there's no actual constitutional thing separate. I mean, there's sort of different... Yeah, it, 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 it is sort of considers itself a secular society, but it's not as dogmatic as it is like the, in, in America. It is part of, I believe, uh, the Declaration of Independence or whatever. Some of the, there is not there is this sort of there's a constitutional thing about how important it is to separate church and state. But the church in Germany does still have like this residual uh, influence on certain things. Like the the state still collects taxes for the church, for example, the Kirchensteuer. That is like this. That's basically a, a, the, the state. Uh, performing a service simply for the for the church, you know. If you register as a Christian, then you have to um, then you have to pay tax, and that tax goes to the church. So it's not not a, it's not an absolute ban. And a lot of uh, uh, schools will still have crosses up and and things like that. In in so it's not like an absolute ban. But yeah, it's a there is it considers itself a secular society. Also, there's big regional differences. I mean, uh, and and. And also, you know, like churches and education, all these kind of things are often uh, governed on a regional level. So you have like the federal level and the state levels. A lot of these kind of issues are governed by uh, state level. So and if and states like Bavaria, where, you know, the um, ruling party is often is the Christian social union, um, you will have, yeah, you'll, you, they will have like laws protecting Christian holidays and Christian sort of of values yes it's, it's so just to to make it clear something which i very found very strange is that from your paycheck if you are a christian for example your part of your pay a percentage of your pay will be taken directly from your paycheck and given to the church which i find very strange indeed and also something else how the state uh, uses uh enforces let's say religious tradition is that you cannot have shops open on Sundays throughout Germany. 
Yeah, again, this is like there's, there's a sort of there's a sort of creeping debate about this all the time. Like like retailers and people, they will they will they they keep lobbying to like uh, soften that ban. So yeah, you, you know the the the, the Sunday trading laws are still a little bit more strong than they are in the rest of the Western world, I would say. And uh, you, they, and that's partly because trade unions are a little bit stronger here too. I mean, there's also this, they protect workers. And so a lot of the sort of um, uh, centre-left social democrat type people will be in favour of uh, protecting Sunday trading. And I mean, in the in Berlin, I know that there's like four Sundays a year. There's this, like one, one compromise they've come to is this four Sundays a year the retailers are allowed to trade. So all the um, uh, department stores and the um, shopping malls are all open for those, for those like Sundays for certain hours. But then other Sundays, in, like, you know, normally it's like all closed and you can't do it and it's illegal. And it's also like little shops are allowed to open it's, and you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah very strange that uh, it comes from religious tradition, but because of the trade unions saying, we want to make sure that workers have at least one day off on a regular basis where they can plan things around the family. It's interesting that it's moved from religious tradition and that it's being kept by workers' unions. And if we look at uh, the amount of religion that's in Germany, I was quite surprised to find out that 62% of Germans are Christians, officially registered on paper Christians. How much they believe or not is, is another matter. But if you live in places like Berlin or the other big cities in Germany, you wouldn't really encounter much of that. Only 32% of Germans are officially not affiliated with any church. So, yes, so there seems to be actually quite a – there seems to be a lot of religious people in Germany. Yeah, although East Germany is like – this is a big the difference between East and West is East Germany is, is very secular. In fact, uh, I read somewhere that – East Germany is like the most atheist of any area in anywhere in the world. It's like the highest proportion of atheists. So there's like there's the kind of a big regional difference there. I guess coming from the German Democratic Republic, discouraging religion. Yeah, and odd as well because a lot of the um, in, in, in the history of East Germany, a lot of the and in, 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 if you take compare Poland for example, the the church was like a big. Uh, uh, part of the resistance to the communist rule was centered on the Catholic Church, which is why the, the Poland is extremely Catholic now, and that's partly because it became it was a popular movement in the uh, in the anti-communist as part of the anti-communist movement. But that isn't so much the case in East Germany. It didn't seem to have been anyway. Well, I think when most of our listeners will listen back to this, it will be after Easter. So don't worry if you're living in Germany, you can dance again now without facing a fine. So, Ben Knight, freelance journalist, thank you very much for joining us here on This Week in Germany. If you'd like to read Ben's articles on German politics, head over to his website, benknight.de. And now for this week's News in Brief. A search has been underway to find the data recorder that was on German Wings flight 4U9525, which crashed into the Alps in March. On Friday, a recovery team has found the second black box. Investigators from France have confirmed that the co-pilot has used the automatic pilot function to lower the plane and then change its settings to speed it up. The aircraft reached a speed of 700 kilometers an hour, about 430 miles per hour, when it hit the mountains. On Saturday, there was a massive fire at a refugee center in Troglitz in the state of Saxon-Anhalt. Officials said that at least one person, and possibly more, came around 2 a.m. to break in and set fire to the house. Fortunately, there were only two people inside the house at the time, and both were able to escape the burning building. It was with the help of a neighbor who alerted the two inside that they were able to flee unharmed. Thomas de Mazier, the federal interior minister, said that the fires looked to have started due to deliberate arson. He denounced the act as heinous and said that those responsible belonged behind bars. This is not the first time that refugees have been attacked in the area. Recently, the mayor of Troglitz resigned after having been threatened by the NPD, Germany's far-right party, for his support in the refugee shelters in the city. The fire at the asylum center came just a few days after another arson attack in Berlin, 
on an art installation that supported refugees. And that's this week's News in Brief. If you'd like a quick and simple way to keep up with the latest from Germany, sign up for our weekly email newsletter, which you can find on our website, thisweekingermany.de. And now it's time for April's Film Club feature. So, of course, I'm joined by Malachi Ray Rempen, the filmmaker. Say hello. Hello, Daniel. So what film are we reviewing this month? This month, we're taking a look at Der Untergang, or Downfall, a 2004 German film by director Oliver Hirschbiegel, which is about Hitler's last few days um, towards the end of World War II. Mostly, most of the film takes place in his bunker and sort of how he slowly goes insane, seen through the eyes of uh, a young early 20s secretary that he hires. Yes. So uh, we follow this secretary from the moment at the beginning of the film when she's hired um, up until the um, the last days in, in the bunker. And um, it's... We we do loosely follow her, but also it's the, the story is built through a lot of the testimonies of um, the people who work there in the bunker. Well, the film is actually bookended by interviews with the actual woman who was who was his secretary during that time. Sort of how she how horrible she feels about what she did, and how um, well I won't give away the ending and sort of the her emotional journey, and that is sort of the. the that is the emotional arc of the film, which is a really interesting one. Yes, and it, um, the film stars um, in the um, leading role um, Bruno Ganz, um, who we have um, talked about in a recent film club, well, from a couple of months ago, um, Der Himmel über Berlin. So he's a, he's a well-known actor, and it must have been a pretty difficult role to take on. And he does it so well. He somehow manages, I mean, Hitler was such a, like his his mannerisms are so over the top and so ridiculous sometimes that he but he manages to make it seem real and not just overacting, um, which must be some sort of magic trick because, I, you know, as as opposed to the whoever it was that played Hitler in Inglorious Bastards, where it's just so this caricature of Hitler and not really like you're not expected to believe it is actually him. Whereas Bruno Gantz really inhabits him, and that must have been a hard thing to do, especially having to wear that mustache. <laughs> yeah, riding the bus with the mustache on. Yeah, sure. Um, but I mean, that's, it's uh, it's interesting that you, you talk about um, the, there's, uh, there's a lot of depictions um, of Hitler which are uh, very um, caricatured um, and also a lot of um, media outside of, Germ- of Germany have depicted um, Hitler. But here, um, Germany was able to tell the story from a German perspective. Um, and yeah, it also, people were worried that, um, the film humanized Hitler too much, which I think is a pretty unnecessary criticism. I mean, the point, the point is to be accurate. And I think it showed him in moments of complete insanity and complete evil. For example, when he basically says that the uh, civilians left in Berlin, we don't really need to care about if they all died while it's their fault. That's, um, you know, essentially you know, survival of the fittest, and if they're not fit enough, then that then that's their fault. And then there's um, uh, moments where you kind of see where his um, charisma was. So, for example, when he's hiring the secretaries at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, the film got uh, pretty much universal acclaim, although it didn't escape some criticism for that exact reason, for it being humanizing Adolf Hitler from actually from. Wim Wenders, the director of Himmel über Berlin, who directed Bruno Ganz in, in this in that other great film. Um, but I think it's sort of if you continue to, in my this is my personal opinion. Now we're wandering into Malachi's personal opinion territory. <laughs> I think if you don't, you know, the by making him a monster, by making him a, a caricature, by making him something subhuman or more than human, or sort of inhuman in in any way it implies that it would only happen like that hit that a hitler can only ever return if there are brown shirts and swastikas and crazy people with you know bad haircuts um on at podiums uh shouting wildly you know like like he did And, and by humanizing him you show that look he was just a dude and this could and i think that actually furthers the purpose of trying to prevent this from ever happening again which is the whole point by by not making him seem two-dimensional by making him seem you know 
he was a dude. He was. Mm -hmm. And this could happen again. And he won't look like Hitler. He won't sound like Hitler. He'll be, you know, someone completely different. And that's what we have to recognize. Yeah. So there there are some uh, moments where you really experience, um, um, as Hannah Arendt would put it, the the banality of evil, how sometimes he smiles and he's friendly. um, And then sometimes you see him for the evil person that we we recognize. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to have that experience. But as for the film in general, it's it's a very tough watch. It's certainly not a laugh a minute comedy. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what's cool about the film is that it it sort of it it what it depicts is Hitler's growing insanity and sort of how he sort of falls apart mentally in the bunker in his last few days there and how his top commanders, the people who were the most loyal of his entire troop, like of anybody in the, in in the world, these were the, the the loyals of the the loyals of the loyals. And they, even they kind of looking at each other and being like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Like he, you know, as Hitler's making these grand plans on this big map and how he's going to bring forces in from the East and the West. And they're like, they're like, they're trying to protest with him that these forces do not exist. Berlin is falling. They have to evacuate, but Hitler is in his own world now. And, and um, that's sort of the, that's where the conflict arises in the film. Yes, and um, for anyone who's um, interested in in the history of the Second World War, it's an absolute must. I mean, it really does depict the horror of the fall of Berlin. Um, I mean, we see at some point um, uh, Hitler Youth uh, members trying to hold back tanks and just the... Well, that's sort of, you know, at the end of the war, there was nobody left. There were no, except kids, essentially, that they had to send out, you know, young girls and boys that they just chipped out to the front, essentially. And, um, but I wouldn't say it's not really a war movie in the classic sense. I mean, it's, it's a war movie in, in the way that, um, Dr. Strangelove is a war movie in the sense that it all takes place in one room, essentially, or one building or one sort of area. And you sort of, um, get an experience of the war through what's happening through the conflicts of this bunker. Um, it's not, it's not really a gratuitous in the way that, um, other war movies can tend to be, which I like. Yeah. So, um, I would say that it's, um, it's a very good film. It's, um, uh, I mean, we there's a lot of um, Nazi films from Germany now um, because, I mean, let's be honest, they do sell very well abroad. Uh, but this is the one you have to see. I this. would say if you're gonna see, like, if you're if you're gonna see a German take on on Nazism, this is the one. This is the one you should see. Yeah, um, and it's it, it's historically important, and it's it's fairly accurate as well. So I think it's it's well worth watching. So. Would you recommend this film? I sure would, Daniel. Next month, we're going to be doing a double bill, and we're going to do the top-grossing German comedy films by Michael Bully Herbig, and those are Traumschiff Surprise and Schuh des Manitou. That's Traumschiff Surprise and Schuh des Manitou are going to be next month's film club films. Coming up now is Destination Germany. We're taking you on a journey somewhere in the country that is well worth a visit. Whether you're a tourist or a permanent resident, a foreigner or a German citizen. Here, we'll be covering the famous sites as well as those little-known corners of Deutschland. All that matters is showing you that Germany is an interesting and exciting place to visit. And if you enjoy the destinations that we talk about each week, check out our website, thisweekingermany.de, and we'll have photos of each week's destination. Last time we talked about something in the front of everyone's mind here, beer. And, more specifically, we took a look at what visitors can expect when taking a trip to the Becks Brewery in the city-state of Bremen. You can tour their factory and find out about how the number one worldwide German beer is made. And remember, after you take this fun, guided tour through the beer-making process, you get to sample some of their products as well. So, Rob, what is on our lineup for this week? This week, we're going to look at a really cool monument located in the southwest of the country. We're traveling down to the state of Bavaria to the city of Kelheim. Overlooking the entire city is the mountain called Michelsburg. And on top of this mountain is a grand memorial called Befreiungshalle. Befreiung. That would translate to liberation in English. I guess this is a monument dedicated to some sort of... um, time when people were liberated does that make sense at all (laughs) yes it was built by king ludwig 
King Ludwig, Ludwig, King Ludwig I of Bavaria, back in the 1800s, to commemorate victories against Napoleon during the Wars of Liberation. I guess this is the kind of project which they spent years building, and it's so grand. I mean, just from the way that you've described it. So, is this the kind of memorial which is grand and beautiful to behold? What does it look like? Well, it is a huge circular building that sits on top of a mountain, and you can see it from a long way off. There are three tiers to this golden yellow building, with the largest being at the bottom, and it gets a little narrower as it gets taller. At the top of the first tier is a ring of human statues that represents each of the German regions that were involved in the battles against Napoleon. The second tier is decorated with impressive columns, and the third is topped with statues of German warriors. Both the second and third tier, both the second and third tiers have balconies that visitors can look out down the mountain and across the Bavarian lands. How about the inside? What does that look like? Is it as impressive on the inside as you made the outside sound? The interior is. Exceedingly marvelous. There is a round oculus in the ceiling that gives natural light to the entire room. A ring around the inner room has plaques and inscriptions of each battle that took place. Joining these are thirty-four angels that are seven meters tall, holding hands to form a circle. Anything visitors should know before making plans to see the Hall of Liberation in Kelheim? As I said earlier, it is at the top of a mountain. You can take a nice hour, hour and a half hike up there from the bottom. Or you can take the Ludwig Railway for a fee. While there's no regularly guided tours, if you're thinking about going with a group, you can call ahead and arrange one. So if you're in central Bavaria, and I would highly recommend going to the city of Kelheim to check out the Befreiungshalle. If you want a better idea of what this place looks like, go to our website thisweekingermany.de for some photos. Next up, our German of the Week section, where we put the spotlight on a prominent person from this week's news, a German citizen or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who's had an effect, for better or worse, on German culture, society, or politics. Our German of the Week celebrated his 85th birthday on Friday, making him the oldest living chancellor of the country, Helmut Kohl. Kohl was the chancellor for 16 years and was in power during the reunification. He helped to build the European Union, as well as overseeing Germany's switch from the Deutschmark to the Euro. The current Chancellor Angela Merkel, as well as the influential U.S. diplomat Henry Kissinger, wrote articles for one of Germany's biggest newspapers, Bild, in Kohl's honor. They both praised him for his contributions in helping Germany become what it has today. Before he was elected to the position of Chancellor, Kohl lived in the state of Rhineland-Palatinate and was the region's state premier. As a top candidate, his party, the conservative CDU party, led him to the top governmental position in 1982. He served until 1998, when he was ousted by the Social Democrat Gerhard Schröder. He was known for thinking large and getting things done. He was also praised for working well with foreign powers, such as the French president François Mitterrand, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, and the U.S. president George Bush. That's the end of episode number sixty-six. We'd like to thank our Facebook fans for getting us all the way up to twelve hundred likes. If you want to get updates from the news in Germany during the week, you can find our link to our Facebook page on our website, thisweekingermany.de. And this week in Germany is produced by me, Daniel Winter. It is written and presented by myself and Rob Bishop. Thank you to Ben Knight for joining us on our top story about the Easter dancing ban. You can find more of his journalism work at bennight.de. Also, a big thanks to Malachi Ray Rimpen for talking to us in our film club. You can see his filmmaking work at mmrimpen.com. Lots of links in this last section because I'm going to remind you once again: if you want to get weekly email updates, follow us on Twitter, Spreaker, Spotify, SoundCloud, and as well as Facebook. As we already mentioned, all of those de- all of those details are on that very same website, thisweekingermany.de. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back next Monday with more of This Week in Germany. Yeah.